Hello, volcano nerds, and welcome. This is our first video about US volcanoes. Thank you so much for bearing with me. A lot of outside interference kept me from recording this first video, so I appreciate you all and thank you. As promised, we will be starting with the volcanic area that I studied for my master's, the San Rafael Volcanic Fields. We are going to start with where this place is. It's located in Utah, right here, actually, within an area known as the Transition Zone. The transition zone is a zone where the Colorado Plateau and the Basin Range meet. There are a lot of volcanic systems within the transition zone, and we will be covering some of these in future videos. The transition zone itself can be broken up into the northern and southern areas. The difference? The chemistry of the rocks, lavas, and magmas. Everything in the northern transition zone will have a similar chemical composition, and the same can be said of the southern transition zone. The transition zone itself has a different chemical composition from the volcanoes of the Basin and Range, which is an extension region, and the Colorado Plateau, which is its compression region, aka types of rocks. So the transition zone tends to be tholeitic to alkaline rocks. The San Rafael Volcanic Field is located on the Colorado Plateau side of the zone, rather than being on the Basin and Range area like the Black Rock Desert Volcanic Field. Second thing, why is it called a volcanic field and not a volcano? This is where things start to get cool. The San Rafael is a bunch of dikes and sill complexes that are exposed. This would lead to quite a few volcanic edifices, meaning if the erosion hadn't happened, there would be a bunch of volcanoes there. And they're all different areas where activity has happened that has a specific chemistry, aka the amount of certain elements, types of rocks, etc. The field itself would be considered extinct, and this is because there has been so much erosion that a lot of the dikes and sills are exposed. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And this is the plumbing system of the volcano. Your dikes and sill, your dikes are gonna go up down movement and your sills are your vertical movement. Now, let's get into it. The San Rafael volcanic field formed between 3.8 and 4.6 million years ago. And overall about 843 meters of erosion has occurred at the site. This is an estimate, not exact, which has exposed many of the dikes and sills of the system, though not all. Some are still below the surface. The magma has cooled, and if we see within the dikes and sills, two types of rock, gabbro and cyanate, and they look like this. They are tholeitic to alkaline and chemical makeup, allowing them to be part of the transition zone, and we find that the cyanite within the cells form in blebs, which is kind of like little bubbles, and as well as large areas. It seems as though the two types of rock separated while cooling within the sills, which is again, our sideways movement and storage of magma. We don't really see this happening in the dikes, which is our vertical movement, with the exception of one or two spots. Um, and this is where my study came in. Uh, we wanted to know why this was happening. And uh, was this something called immiscibility? It was definitely differentiation, AKA they were once together and now they're apart. Differentiation generally means one came from the other due to the evolution of magma, not necessarily immiscibility. So let's pause for a second. What is immiscibility? Well, we have seen salad dressing made of oil and vinegar, yes. Uh, if you shake it up, they mix. If you let it sit, it just goes back to oil and vinegar. And that's because oil and vinegar are immiscible liquids. They separate or differentiate over time. They don't mix. So immiscibility is a specific type of differentiation where you have at least two liquids mixed together, and as they cool, they separate out. So we think it's immiscibility. How did I go about looking at this? I'll put it in non-scientific terms. I took rocks that were crushed into basically dust, heated them up to return them to a liquid, stuck them in acid and shook it up real good, and then stuck it through a machine called an ICP OES and voila, data. This data was made up of major element information, AKA the ones that we have the most of, like silica, iron, magnesium. Minor element data was taken before I came to the school. Um, and these are things like lithium, uh, neurodinium, rubidium, strontium, stuff like that, which are in much teeny, teeny types, and we call them parts per million when we measure them, or PPM. Measured elements are instead measured in weight percent, which is a much bigger amount. Okay, so what's the big deal with the chemistry? I use these this data to make models. Basically, I take the data and I can <laughs> plot it on graphs, like this one. So to look at how it compares to standard data, we basically take our data and then compare it to global data. Basically, this tells me if my stuff is like other stuff, and if it's like other stuff, that means it probably came from a similar origin. That's how we know we have a gabbro and a cyanate. You can see that actually right here in this, we can see that our data tends to match more of a gabbro for one. It's also how I can figure out how deep my stuff formed and what other types of magma it matches. 
we realized our data was very close to ocean island salts and earth magnetism, which is really, really weird because as we saw earlier, it's smack dab in the middle of the United States. So we did some other calculations and it still determined that it was impacted by earth magnetism. So how and why? Well, turns out two plates were subducted off the coast of California, the Farallon and the Kualon plate. The Farallon plate is, in particular is seen as a cause for the formation of the transition zone, basin and range zone, and the Sierra Nevada regions. This plate, after being subducted, continued to move under the United States and is now estimated to be somewhere under Michigan. It caused the lithosphere, which is our upper mantle and the crust, to become hydrated, meaning it's rich in water, like a sponge, allowing it to melt at lower temperatures and pressures and allowing it to mix with the asthenosphere, which is the lower mantle. Then it came up, forming dikes and sills, later some eruptions in the region, and when it cooled in the sills, it separated. And the addition of water allowed us to have some water-rich minerals like hornblende in our sample, hornblende in our samples, as well as biotites. And you could see them there, like one or two inches long. I have a picture here. What we were able to determine from plotting data and looking at the sills themselves was that differentiation of cyanite from the gabbro occurred after emplacement within the sills, meaning after it was in the sills itself, starting to cool, gabbro was forming, and through something called fractional crystallization separating out and allowing for this an evolved magma to form aka our cyanide. The two rocks have a similar chemistry though so we know they are comagmatic. Basically they had the same source, the same parent, uh, and the cyanide is just more evolved. So it's a secondary rock formation aka gabbro came first. This means the gabbro formed separately from the magma allowing cyanides to become more silica and sodium rich evolved. So why was studying this place so important? Monogenetic fields aren't really something that is super duper studied. Most people are interested in studying arc magnetism like Japan, the Aleutians, uh, or hotspot magnetism such as Yellowstone National Park, Iceland hotspot stuff, uh, Hawaii is a hotspot volcano. And so studying something like the San Rafael volcanic field specifically, since many dikes are, and sills are exposed and because it's a monogenetic field, especially since it has differentiation and possibly immiscibility, it allows a greater understanding for magma evolution. It allows us to study what happened there and to understand how this type of magma, especially one that has a lot of water, could impact eruptions, which to say it would be more explosive, especially when it's an evolving magma. This can help with understanding future eruptions for systems like this one, predicting how dangerous an eruption could occur. If you're interested in the paper that was written from this research, the link is below in the doobly-doo, as are a list of references and the link to my original thesis manuscript. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications, ding ding, if you are interested in learning more. Next time we will be covering the, covering the San Francisco volcanic field, which is another monogenetic field within the transition zone. This one is currently still active, if not dormant. But if you are interested in learning about other volcanoes in the USA, please leave a comment below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Live long and prosper. Mm -hmm.